Let's see how we can use the density matrix to describe some qubit states. And let's link those descriptions to the block sphere visualization. First, let's write down a general statement about the density matrix for a qubit state. Let's write down the quantity known as the purity. This is the trace of rho squared. This rho is the density operator or the density matrix. And let's link this quantity to the trace of rho. The trace of rho is equal to one. That is the normalization condition. It is just like taking the state and then taking the inner product of the state with itself. So we define that to be equal to one uh, because we want the state to be normalized. So we can actually do quantum mechanics without normalizing states, but it makes computations a lot more tedious. We, can't, we have to keep dividing by coefficients. So to avoid all of that tedious division by coefficients, what we do is we define the state with the normalization condition. And when we're dealing with the density matrix, we set the trace of rho equal to one. That's equivalent to that normalization condition. And so this quantity, which is the trace of rho squared, is the purity. These quantities are sometimes equal to each other, but a lot of the time they are not equivalent to each other. In general, this quantity is sandwiched between one, which is equivalent to the trace of rho, and one half. So the lower bound is one half and the upper bound is one. When is it equal to one? Well, that case is the pure state. So if we're dealing with a pure state, then we have an equality over here and we can just ignore this half. But if we're not dealing with a pure state, the trace of rho squared is gonna be somewhere in between one half and one. Another special case we can consider is at the lower end. What if the trace of rho squared is equal to one half? And what if this is strictly less than? Well, that case over here, when this is an equality, that is known as the maximally mixed state. And we'll see that state later in this video. Another uh, important thing that we can write down over here is we can write down a relationship that links this value of r. So r is the length of the block vector. It is a scalar value. And we can also think of it as one of the three coordinates that we need to specify a point in spherical coordinates. So we have r, that's the distance away from the center of our coordinate system. And we also have two angles, which we can denote by theta and phi. So what does r have to satisfy? r is sandwiched between zero and one. When r is equal to one, we're dealing with a pure state. So that's the same as this equality over here. So when the trace of rho squared is equal to the trace of rho, which is equal to one, then we have r is equal to one. And on the other end of the extreme, when this purity is equal to one half, that's when r is equal to zero. So that's the maximally mixed state. Now, what we can do is have a look at some examples. So first we will consider examples where r is equal to one. So let's have a look at those examples first. Let's take the computational basis states and turn them into density matrices. So first I'm gonna take the state denoted by zero and I'm gonna turn that into a density matrix. So this is actually a projector. We have a ket and then a bra. Let's write this out in matrix notation. Let's express this uh, as a matrix and another matrix. So this ket, is a column matrix with entries one, zero. And what about this bra? Well, it is a row matrix with entries one, zero. And when we combine these guys in a catch bra, that is known as an outer product. And that produces a two by two matrix with entries one, zero, zero, zero. And this is equivalent to the uh, one half of the identity plus Pauli Z. And I'll write capital Z over here, and that denotes the Pauli Z matrix. Another way we can write this is as a set of three coordinates, as X, Y, Z coordinates, if we're dealing with a Cartesian coordinate system. So this is equivalent to zero, zero, 
plus one. So that's what we're dealing with over here. So this, this is x, y, and z. And another way to think of these values is they are the values uh, that actually multiply the Pauli matrices when we write this density matrix out in full. So in general, the density matrix can be written as a linear combination of the identity and all three of the traceless Pauli matrices. And there's also this uh, factor of one half out the front. So the x, y, z coordinates are the coefficients that multiply those matrices. You can see that Pauli x and Pauli y do not appear over here. That's because their coefficients are zero. But Pauli z does appear. That's because its coefficient is plus one. Let's also have a look at what happens if we take the one state. So this is another of those computational basis states. Collectively, these are the eigenstates of the Pauli z operator. This zero state has an eigenvalue of plus one, and this one state has an eigenvalue of minus one. So let's write these guys out. This ket is going to be a column with entries zero, one, and the bra is going to have entries zero, one. So how do we go from a ket to a bra? We have to take the conjugate transpose. So we're taking the transpose over here, and we're also complex conjugating all of the elements. When we complex conjugate real numbers, there's no effect. So that's why we don't actually see the complex conjugate having any effect when we go from a ket to a bra. Now, if we take the outer product, we're going to get the matrix representation that looks like this. We have 0, 0, 0, 1. So this term in the top left is the 0, 0 term in the matrix. And this term in the bottom right, that is the 1, 1 term. Both of those terms are diagonal terms. And if you take the sum of these two projectors, you actually get the identity matrix. So that's, you can also see that by just adding these two matrices together. If you add this matrix to this matrix, you get the two by two identity matrix, which has ones on the diagonal and zeros on the off diagonal. This is equivalent to the identity matrix minus the Pauli Z, and we can write that as zero, zero, minus one. So these can be interpreted as uh, coordinates in a, a three-dimensional visualization space. So we're, we're just using these coordinates to construct a three-dimensional visualization that helps us uh, conceptualize the qubit state. And now let's have a look at some other eigenstates. Let's have a look at the eigenstates of the Pauli X operator. We can denote them as plus or minus. So I'll take the catch bra combination of plus and minus. And why am I denoting them as plus or minus? Well, that's because when we write them out in the Pauli Z eigenbasis, that's the same eigenbasis that's being used to construct these matrix representations, it's going to look like this. We're going to have one over the square root of two times the column vector one plus or minus one. Why is there a factor of one on the square root of two? That is a normalization coefficient. That goes back to this property over here. We are normalizing the state. So what is going on over here? This is the ket, and now we need a bra. So we also have another coefficient, and the bra is a row vector. And now let's perform the outer product, and that's going to give us one half. We combine these two coefficients, and we're going to get one plus or minus one plus or minus one, one. So on the diagonal, we can see the identity, and on the off diagonal, we can see Pauli x with a coefficient of plus or minus one. And we can write that out over here. We're gonna have one half the identity plus or minus Pauli X. And if we write it in this form, we're gonna have plus or minus one, zero, zero. So there is the coefficient of Pauli Y and Pauli Z, that's equal to zero. And the coefficient of Pauli X, that's plus or minus one. And now let's have a look at the Pauli Y case. So we can take the eigenstates of the Pauli Y operator, and we can denote them as plus or minus I. And you'll see in a moment when I write out, I write out the matrix representation, why I'm using this notation. The ket has this form. We have one over the square root of two times one plus or minus I. And then when we take the conjugate transpose, we still have this normalization coefficient, but then 
we have to take the complex conjugate. So that means flipping the sign of that imaginary unit, which means we have minus plus i. So note that this plus minus turns to a minus plus. Then when we perform the outer product, we're going to get one and one on the diagonal. And on the off diagonal, we're gonna have plus or minus i, minus plus i. So why is there a one over here? When you multiply this element and this element together, you're always going to get plus one in both cases because the signs are opposite. And plus i and minus i, these are multiplicative inverses of each other, which means when you multiply them, you get the identity. This is the multiplicative identity, which is one. And we can read off the elements over here. We can see that on the diagonal, we have the identity matrix, and on the off diagonal, we have plus or minus poly y. And this is equal to zero, plus or minus one, zero. So the coefficients of poly x and poly z are zero, and the coefficients of poly y are plus and minus one. One thing that you might notice with all of these examples is that if we were to take x squared, y squared, and z squared, we would always get one. So why is that the case? Well, we can think of this as the dot product of r with itself. That's the same as r squared, which is x squared plus y squared plus z squared, and that's equal to one. So what we're dealing with here is a pure state. All of these examples so far have been pure states. That means they lie on the surface of the block sphere. So all of these guys are somewhere on the surface of the block sphere, and they're actually at special points. They are where the x, y, and z axes intersect with the unit sphere. So these two guys over here, they are at the north pole and the south pole of the sphere. So this, this uh, density matrix over here uh, represents a state that is right at the top of the sphere. And if we go all the way to the bottom, the antipodal point, that is this state over here. So those guys are the north and the south pole. And then if we imagine the x-axis and the y-axis, then we can look at the intersection points. So these guys over here are going to be at the intersection points of the x-axis uh, at the plus side and the minus side. And then if we look at the y-axis, we will see two intersection points as well. So this is a three-dimensional visualization. And all of these guys are on the surface because we're dealing with a pure state. And one thing that I want to write down is in the previous video, we had a form for the density matrix that looked like this. We had the identity plus this R vector dot product with a sigma vector. And this over here, we can unpack that. This relationship over here, we can unpack that as x times sigma x plus y times sigma y, and then we have z times sigma z. Now, sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z, this is an alternative notation uh, for the Pauli matrices. We have x, y, and z over here. So this linear combination over here is used to construct this density matrix. Or in other words, we can express the density matrix in terms of these guys. And for the special case where x squared plus y squared plus z squared is equal to one, we're dealing with the surface of the sphere. But in general, r does not have to equal one. r can be less than one, and that's when we're dealing with a mixed state. So the final example I wanna show you in this video is the maximally mixed state. That corresponds to r equals zero. So that's r equals zero. Let's have a look at that state. So the r equals zero state, the density matrix is just going to be one half of the identity. What about this term over here? Well, this term is equal to zero. The length of this vector is zero. So that means x is zero, y is zero, and z is zero. All components of the vector have to be equal to zero. And that means this term disappears, and we're just left with one half of the identity. And we can write that as, one half times the catch bra of zero, zero, and then one half of this one, one catch bra. So those are these guys over here. And we can also write this as one half times the identity matrix. And we can read off the trace. We can add 
one plus one and then divided by a half. Or we can distribute that half inside. That's going to give us a half plus a half. And the trace is equal to one over here. So I'll write that over here. The trace of rho is equal to one. That's the normalization condition. But what we're more interested in is what is the purity of this state? What is rho squared? Rho squared is one quarter i squared. See, we just have to apply this twice. So a half times a half is a quarter, and then we have i squared. The square of the identity is equal to the identity. We're just applying the identity twice. So then we get one quarter of the identity. And if we have a quarter of the identity, we have a quarter and a quarter on the diagonal, right? Just like we have over here. So we're adding a quarter plus a quarter, which is a half. So that means that the trace of rho squared is equal to one half. And this is the lowest possible value it can have. It's one over the dimension of the Hilbert space we're dealing with. If we were dealing with a higher dimensional Hilbert space, then we would have a larger value in, in the bottom of this fraction over here. But for a single qubit, this is the maximally mixed state. And another thing you can observe over here is that this is not the only way you can express the identity matrix. You could also express this identity matrix in terms of the eigenstates of poly x or the eigenstates of poly y. So we can write this over here is written in terms of the eigenbasis of the poly z operator. But we could also write it in terms of the eigenbasis of poly x or poly y. Or we can choose some different basis. So this is not unique. You can construct this maximally mixed state or this maximally mixed density operator from different combinations of different states. And what does this actually tell us? We can read this off as a probability multiplying the state for a pure density matrix. And over here, we have another pure density matrix with a probability. So we have a 50% chance of the state being in this pure state and a 50% chance of the state being in this pure state. That is why we call it a mixed state, because we're mixing pure states together in a probabilistic linear combination. So these probabilities also have to add up to one. And they do over here. We have a half and a half that is equal to one. So this is an extreme over here. Just like these guys are an extreme. This is a pure state. That's the extreme on the right-hand side. And then we have the extreme on the left-hand side, which is the maximally mixed state. But most mixed states are not going to be at this extreme. They're going to be somewhere within the block sphere. So hopefully this video was helpful. We saw some examples of how you can construct uh, these density matrices from the states of qubits. And you can also convert those to coordinates in a three-dimensional space. And that is the block sphere visualization, which helps us conceptualize the state of a qubit. It turns it into a picture that we can reason with. And finally, we also had a look at, we also had a look at the maximally mixed state, which is as mixed as you can possibly get. And it has some very interesting properties. So the most important quantity that we were dealing with in this video, which allows us to classify whether we're dealing with a pure state or a mixed state is the trace of rho squared. This quantity is called the purity. And if the purity is equal to one, you're dealing with a pure state. And if it's less than one, you're dealing with a mixed state.